The latest release of content for Guild Wars 2, known as the Ice Brood Saga, has been met with a, let's say, critical response. However, I think I've gained a bit of a reputation for defending some parts of the saga, and I think that's confused people a little bit. But allow me to explain why I think the Ice Brood Saga, while flawed, is actually a very positive sign for the future of Guild Wars 2, and of course, the expansion. So, let's first address the elephant in the room, the story. There are going to be spoilers, so if you care about that, turn away now. Or just a lot 30 minutes to playing through it, and then come back. The Ice Brood Saga storyline was rushed towards the end, no question about that. In fact, the whole thing was rushed, and thrown together, but we'll get to that later. From completely dropped plot points like Braham's legendary bow being irrelevant, to the now seemingly pointless character development of Jormag possessing the cunning to almost bamboozle our very own Omega Dragon Aurene, only to fall straight into our extremely obvious trap. All the way up to obliterating two massive villains in a 10 second cutscene, and a conspicuous and somewhat confusing lack of proper epilogue and resolution. The list goes on, but I'm not here to roast the story. One of my fellow countrymen already did a more than adequate job of that. But what I can do is explain why I think the weaknesses of the Ice Brood Saga do not mean the expansion will suffer the same flaws, and how the saga also contains some very promising design elements that, if carried forward, can make Guild Wars 2 great again. So let's begin. And what better way to begin than a trip down memory lane to the announcement for the Ice Brood Saga. It was one of the most overhyped pieces of marketing I have ever seen. But why was this? I think this was because ArenaNet originally planned to run the saga for a few seasons and use it as a replacement for an expansion while they worked on their new projects. Well, that didn't exactly work out as a significant chunk of the company was laid off six months before the saga's announcement. ArenaNet, like any sane company, plan a long time into the future, and the Ice Brood saga was coming one way or another. But all of a sudden, they had to get an expansion ready to go as soon as possible, and also have something going on in the meantime to deliver on that announcement. Out of nowhere, what I think was probably a multi-year storyline had to be compressed down into a single season and with potentially less resources as well due to the new development project, End of Dragons. This explains the seemingly inappropriate title of the Ice Brood Saga. Why Ice Brood if it's going to involve Primordus and the Destroyers as well? It seems to me that Primordus was supposed to be introduced later on in the Fire Brood Saga, and then maybe even a third season detailing the conflict between the two primal forces, ending with either the winding down of Guild Wars 2 or a hook into a future expansion. Now, ArenaNet could have left the Ice Brood Saga as a bit of a cliffhanger and continued that story into End of Dragons, but I think ArenaNet wanted more of a fresh start and didn't want to shackle the much-anticipated Canthan expansion to pre-existing dragon storylines. Rather, they want to fully explore new storylines as much as possible, instead of having to deal with dragons for a few more years. This is, in my opinion, a very good call. Jumping into a Guild Wars 2 expansion, or any MMO expansion really, is always very jarring for new or returning players, because you have no idea who the characters are, what happened, and why everyone is suddenly calling you the commander. So I think going for a narrative starting in the expansion, rather than six months before launch, will make the story a lot more cohesive and approachable for new and returning players alike while being a welcome breath of fresh air for us gnarled veterans. With all that in mind, I think ArenaNet wanted rid of the dragon so much, they named the expansion accordingly, hence the slight acceleration of Jormag and Primordus' end. I've never been a huge fan of the dragon storyline. When we're dealing with such impossibly vast forces, it always ends up feeling a little contrived, like Aureen coming back 15 minutes later in game time, or Primordus and Jormag going to sleep in Season 3, and the entire characterization of Timey. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy the story well enough, but I think the stories I've always enjoyed in 
in MMOs and Guild Wars the most have always been the slightly more peripheral stories that are just part of the world, rather than the main driving narrative. Great examples of this would be the Raid storylines, the awesome Bone Skinner quest in Bureau Marches, the Fractal storyline including the challenge modes, and just all the little stories and collections you encounter in the world itself. This is where the storytelling in the game is at its best, and for me, the most compelling and immersive. I think the last section of the story, Ice Brood Saga, Episode 5, Champions, Chapters 1 through 4, and the finale in particular, is mostly where the story in the saga fell a bit short. I do like the very in-the-moment dynamic storytelling in Dragon Response missions, watching Owl just get deleted, or Bram just appear out of nowhere as Primordius' champion was great. I often feel like I'm watching a TV show during story content, with some helpless mobs to cut down as a form of ad break in between exposition and cutscenes just to remind me that I'm actually playing a game. So that was a much more immersive and interesting experience for me to blend story and gameplay together. The slightly haphazard and less scripted experience led to the feeling of events unfolding before my very eyes. Dragon Response missions were certainly not perfect though, and this was the part of the saga that had very short releases and was clearly experimental. The story is often drowned out a bit in the Dragon Response missions, making it a bit harder to follow exactly what is going on, and they tend to just drop some big happening on you with no real context or build up, only to end very abruptly with little to no follow up in the aftermath outside of some dialogue options which definitely felt very rushed, and afterwards you find yourself wondering, is that it? Dragonstorm also gets a special mention as it's undeniably an epic spectacle, with both dragons poised to cuddle each other. And I think if it had been released after two years of sagas with slightly more fleshed out gameplay, perhaps actually engaging a dragon or two properly for once, and an extra 20 seconds of cutscene with a proper epilogue, then I imagine it would have gone down rather well. The content itself is enjoyable, the context and the result is what killed it for a lot of the community. Everything before Champions was perfectly solid. There were some really epic cinematic moments like the reveal of Jormag and seeing Jormag reanimate the Freynair, which is just a triumph of animation and voice acting to characterize this completely alien being trying to communicate with the heroes. It's probably even one of my favorite moments in the entire game so far. Additionally, the story, exploration, and world building in the maps is all great, and while I might quibble over the gameplay a bit, thematically the maps are very effective at telling a story, and there's a lot of detail and atmosphere to absorb, whether that's the Char Civil War, breaking into the fiendish conversion chambers, or just a big furry convention. If anything, the slightly darker, gritty tone and finally a dragon with some personality was a step up in quality. It just moved too fast and didn't explore everything that we wanted to see, while seeming like a downgrade because of the reduction in map quantity. However, I don't have enough time to write YouTube common essays in response to everyone mad at the story. It's a fair enough criticism, and the latter half of the Ice Brood saga is certainly not as extensive and as polished as a ReadNet's usual standard. My point is, is that this was inevitable with a sudden change of development plan. Either the saga was going to be a bit scuffed, or the expansion would suffer. And every single time, I will choose a better expansion in that case. It's a much bigger and pivotal point in the game's history, and although a disappointing saga isn't exactly great for the game's reputation, a disappointing expansion can potentially even be a death sentence. It really is the lesser of two evils. It sucks we won't get to explore the domain of Jormag and Primordus more, and we've missed out on a lot of stories here. And I think a lot of lore buffs have some legitimate axes to grind with Aridna after this, but that doesn't mean there can't be great stories told in the expansion. The reason I would say the expansion quality won't be affected by the Ice Brood Saga is by looking at, well, the other ones. Season 3 of The Living World had some pretty rushed elements. I'm looking at you, Bitterfrost Frontier. And I would say that Path of Fire was some of the most well-executed story content and world design the game has ever seen. More comparable still was Heart of Thorns. After a period of no expansions for us, Arena decided that there would indeed be expansions for them. A bit similar to the current affair. And although it was certainly a bumpy ride with a pretty brutal gap between the end of Season 2 and the expansion, Heart of Thorns released with an expansive amount of complete new content and systems, and some of the community's favorite maps of all time. To be frank, considering the even more tumultuous time at ArenaNet, and the whole world for that matter, has had over the past year or so, I think we're doing alright considering. 
And I don't think fears about the expansion not delivering on the polish we're used to are warranted. What I would underline here as my point is that the story was looking good up until Champions, and was actually well received up until that point. And even though Champions wasn't ideal, it was better than six months of nothing, and had some redeeming factors that may even have long-term ramifications for the future of the game. I would also say that a lot of the problems and their causes in the saga, notably rushed development and compressed storylines because of the direction change, won't really be as much of an issue moving forwards. This is very clearly demonstrated by the fact that the saga started out strong for a Living World season, likely due to a lot of content they already had developed, but stumbled when they couldn't stretch out the maps anymore and had to somehow figure out how to conclude it on the fly. Arena definitely memed themselves a bit by hyping up the expansion level features. In fact, they were probably doomed from the moment they said that. And while that statement does actually hold up surprisingly well on a gameplay feature level, when players hear that, they think elite specializations and some kind of feature like mounts. I wouldn't be surprised to find out that ArenaNet eventually wanted to add elite specializations and even had an idea for another game-changing mastery, but whatever they had naturally got rolled into the expansion instead, so those words will eternally echo in the nightmares of the studio. Now let's get to everyone's favorite part of the video, discussing some of the mistakes ArenaNet have made in their development cycle and how the Ice Brood saga might be the solution. I think it would be fair to say Arena has had a lot of issues around a few core points. Reusing assets and content to appeal to multiple audiences, replayability, medium to long-term reward structures derived from specific content, not just farming gold for legendaries, balancing the game, and communicating with the player base. Most of the community would probably agree with the fact that those problems have been long running, almost back to the very beginning of the game. And what is really interesting about the Ice Brood saga is that I think Arena really tried to tackle these, or at least try out some approaches to solve them. They probably knew they couldn't fully deliver on their vision for the saga, so why not experiment and try some stuff out? So let's break that down. Asset reuse was a big theme in Ice Brood Saga. This is not only for replayability, but also to speed up the development, requiring less resources so they could focus on the expansion. We saw story bosses become strike missions and, of course, Dragonstorm. Old maps were altered a bit and filled with dragon response missions. This story content was retooled for a replayability and group play oriented audience, and a varied one at that, generating new replayable 5 man, 10 man, and even 30 to 50 player content. Additionally, the wide appeal was increased thanks to difficulty settings and dragon response missions, and the Dragonstorm private instance being more challenging than the public and story ones. Now, the implementation here isn't perfect. There are plenty of ways that dragon response missions at Dragonstorm and strike difficulty scaling could be improved. Strikes have a conspicuous lack of challenge mode and Dragonstorm doesn't change significantly, but to me, this yells loud and clear that ArenaNet understand the problem and are actively taking steps to resolve it. The game design here is, in my opinion, far superior than what we're used to with a lot of older story content in the game being incredibly trivial, single player, and also single playthrough. With the full polish of an expansion, this new design could be simply brilliant. Imagine a canther in which each story boss is a strike mission, on release, where certain story missions are replayable with a hard mode and are great for entry-level endgame and farming, and where perhaps one or two of the maps have a hard mode world boss to promote guild play on a massive level that you've really just don't see in the open world anymore. This type of design is, in my opinion, exactly what Guild Wars 2 needs. Over the history of the game, each community has often felt alienated because ArenaNet decided to develop content for each specific audience separately. In other words, making far more work for themselves than any other MMO. The story is mostly solo-oriented and not very replayable, leading to frustration in the veteran scene, and raids are more or less impossible for a story player who really doesn't care about being good at a video game. This leads to a lot of division in the community and anger towards Arena. It feels very much like a zero-sum game. Whenever one community wins, the other loses. That isn't how development really works, but it's certainly how it's perceived, and I don't blame people for feeling that way. This leads to a very negative narrative in the community and borderline wars between the different groups within the community. 
if ArenaNet can carry this design philosophy into all the content in the expansion, then I think we'll have a completely different experience. Rewards in Guild Wars 2 have always been a heated topic, and it's something the Ice Brood Saga did very well, especially in terms of maintaining a good distribution of rewards from short-term, medium-term, and extreme high-end rewards. I think a lot of people actually sleep on this part of the saga, an area that the living story and the game as a whole has been criticized pretty hard for. I actually ended up re-recording this segment entirely because the first version was overly harsh, so I think it's very easy to overlook. Each episode of the saga brought in a lot of cosmetic and gear rewards, from upgradable weapons to new armor sets, emotes, stat-selectable ascended gear, infusions, and even capes. The rewards are really expansive and of excellent quality, stuff like the bone skinner weapons having a projectile effect, usually reserved for legendaries, is an excellent precedent to set. I think most of the player base has in fact resigned that sort of thing to the gem store at this point to be frank. They're also positioned at a great mid-level in terms of expense, around 100 to 200 gold. I'm highlighting that because a common and fair criticism of the reward structure in the game is that there isn't much in the way of quality mid-tier rewards, which the Bone Skinner weapons absolutely are. Volcanic Stormcaller weapons also would have been very well received, I think, if not for the questionable choice to have the collection achievement tied into the story achievements. Ice Brood Saga even included two legendary trinkets, one for player versus player and one for world versus world, which will soon be joined by one linked to completing many achievements in the saga. They even added the ability to have a version of the legendaries without effects, which is a long requested feature. Hopefully they roll it out to the existing ones so I can use them without being surrounded by a thousand orbs. Just for some perspective here, the Ice Brood Saga holds its own against Living Story Season 4 in terms of skins, the saga having a lot more weapon skins but fewer armor pieces. Season 3, while adding a horde of infusions and legendary weapons, really doesn't stack up well at all elsewhere and is carried very hard by raids. Even if you skew the numbers heavily against the saga by not including variants of weapons like Boreal, Stormcaller, Tengu, and Dragonslayer, the saga still trades blow for blow in terms of cosmetic rewards. The Ice Brood Saga also significantly outperformed Season 4 in terms of special aspirational rewards like infusions, emotes, weapons with effects, capes, and so on. Bear in mind that, once again, there were probably a lot more rewards planned that never saw the light of day, before being repackaged into End of Dragons. Reward design in the saga is also very good. A mixture of crafting, collections, medium rarity drops, extreme rarity drops, and account bound drops ensure that rewards feel pretty tied to the world and your character's journey in a variety of ways. I want to particularly highlight the rare account bound drops from Drakkar and Dragonstorm. I think stuff like that makes every kill a bit exciting, just like hunting down a rare infusion except not quite as extreme. In the same vein, the medium rarity gold convertible drops from Strikes and Dragon Response missions in particular are a very welcome design choice. A lack of mid-tier or just random bonus drops in content that can be converted into some amount of gold is definitely a major common criticism of the rewards in the game. Two blue items and a green being the reward for everything is a meme for a reason. In my opinion, a move to exciting loot at multiple levels of grind and randomness is very important in making the content feel rewarding. Guild Wars 2 is typically very all or nothing. Either you just grind out gold slowly to buy your item, or you win the lottery and get instantly rich. Rewards can't revive the dragons or explore the depths of Tyria with the dwarves for us, but the Ice Brood Saga certainly did a good job in quantity, quality, and implementation of rewards. Even better than I initially thought, so full credit to the rewards team there. As a final note, tiered achievements were also a system added during the saga, which is just a better implementation of achievements, breaking them down into manageable segments with rewards along the way. And I definitely expect to see a lot of those in the expansion. I think a lot of the reward design got overshadowed by some grindy achievements with nothing at the end of them, and the volcanic Stormcaller collection being in the wrong place. But I have to say, I think many of the complaints are unwarranted. They're called achievements for a reason, and what's the point if there is nothing to them? The player base asked for some grindable, long-term achievements and rewards, and ArenaNet gave us exactly what we wanted. They should probably give more than three achievement points, though. I think we can agree on that. 
I'd really like to see cosmetics, little gizmos like the position rewinder, or account bonuses to magic find and so on at the end of loads of achievements so you feel like you're actually progressing outside of watching a number increase painfully slowly. Moving on then to a fun one, communication. Communication has never been ArenaNet's strong suit, and it's been a big pain point over the years, but I think even the saltiest among us can't deny that ArenaNet is looking to change that policy, from reason posts regarding skill balance to roadmaps. This is a clear area the company is focusing on, as improved a lot recently. Now, I know that we've heard a lot of these things before, and it will take a while for the community to trust what is being said, but it's the first step on that road to a much healthier relationship between the veteran community and ArenaNet. I would give particular credit here to the skills team, who even immediately addressed and updated their skill balance notes within days in reaction to community feedback. While on the topic of community feedback, I would quickly point out that trying to address the issues we're talking about here is absolutely acting on our feedback, which is definitely something we like to complain about not happening often. We've been complaining about a lot of the issues we've previously discussed in this video since the beginning of the game, which is why I view the change in approach to be so worthy of pointing out. This is a radical shift and a potential massive change in direction for the company. Finally, let's talk about skills balance. It's always been an issue that certain game modes languish in stagnation for very long periods of time, and, well, that hasn't quite been resolved yet. Understandable, perhaps, with the new elite specializations being suddenly needed, I suppose, but still not acceptable. However, in my opinion, ArenaNet has made some drastic steps and commitments to balancing the game. CMC leaping onto the scene with his balance apocalypse, and now excellent communication, hotfixes, and commitment to frequent updates in the time until the expansion. Don't get me wrong, this is definitely something that needs a lot of work and has had a few row bumps along the way, but we are undeniably making significant progress. Recently, player versus player has had builds for every profession played at the highest level, with nowhere near the level of instant oblivion that it had previously. Pretty much everything works in raids, and Arena is actively trying to create more options for the mandatory roles like quickness, alacrity, healing, and so on. Obnoxious designs still tarnish the competitive game modes, the scars of Path of Fire, they do indeed remain, but in time I have no doubt CMC will swing the hammer. I wouldn't be surprised to see World vs. World get a look soon, as it's the only game mode to really not get any attention, but we'll see about that. I think the delay and lapse in patches is explained by the urgency of the expansion, and obviously elite specialization design is the absolute priority for the skills team, so I think we will have to give them that allowance begrudgingly. And I really hope ArenaNet continue this level of care into the expansion, especially as the new builds are likely to be quite interesting one way or another. So to wrap things up very clearly, yes. The Ice Brood Saga was rushed, and it did have its executional failings. For what it's worth, I think the first few episodes were definitely well done, and that's exactly what we would expect. ArenaNet developed content in multiple teams that rotate, meaning that the early maps and story were probably in a pretty finished state well ahead of time, probably before the announcement. Grothmar Valley is the best example of this, as it was extremely well received by the community. And yes, that was Ice Brood Saga. But that aside, what I'm saying here is that Arena worked with what they had in the circumstances that had befallen them, and used that time to take a look at what they could do to figure out how to address long-standing issues in the game on a design level. And once you have a good design, all it takes is executing it, which honestly, Arena has a pretty damn good track record of doing. Elite specializations, mounts, map storylines, raids, fractal challenge modes and so on are all brilliantly done. The amount of ways Guild Wars 2 stands out from the competition on a systemic level are too many to list here, and I think most people will agree that when ArenaNet do something, it's done very well, most of the time. We just wish they'd do more of it, which, funnily enough, is what might end up happening with these changes in direction. I've probably put more hours into Ice Brood Saga than the other seasons just because of, in my opinion, superior systemic design of replayability. And that's after completing the Legendary Collections and Skyscale Mount Unlock in the other seasons. 
This is because I'm a very gameplay-oriented player, and I value replayability and engagement above all else, and I'll freely admit that. Story content just isn't engaging or replayable to me, but it absolutely could be, as the saga has demonstrated. Poor execution of good design can be fixed easily, but good execution of lacking design is a much harder thing to deal with, hence why it took so long. Each season had its strengths and weaknesses. Season 1 and 2 were dynamic, living and breathing, sign repairing content. Season 3 had some great maps and fan favourite plotlines, but was unfinished in places and had issues with replayability. Season 4 was an epic, cinematic experience, but felt extremely on rails and had a few questionable story points. The Ice Brood Saga trolled the lore enthusiasts hardcore, but in my opinion delivered in replayability and is significantly more engaging than your average story missions or open world auto attack parties. All we need now is a readnet to combine the ideas of the Ice Brood Saga with the best of the other seasons and we'll be good to go. I think it's totally fair to say that the recent content in Guild Wars 2 hasn't been perfected or is even super close to the standard we expect. But to deny the existence of progress in ArenaNet's communication and philosophy regarding content design is a fool's errand. They've heard us and hopefully they use our massive wrinkly brain feedback to make the best expansion yet. Thanks for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback below, and be sure to come and yell at me on stream for being an ArenaNet white knight. I broke down some of the key points in this video, but believe me, I always have more to say. I'll see you there.